Hello, folks. Um, let's get started on our notes on heredity, part one, meiosis, and part two, meiosis and genetic diversity. So meiosis, let's make some gametes, guys. And uh, just some variations on a theme here. Uh, living organisms are distinguished by their ability to reproduce their own kind. Uh, heredity is the transmission of traits from one generation to the next. And variation is demonstrated by the differences in appearance of the offspring shown from the parents. Put it all together, we got genetics. Okay, and that's what we're going to be studying here in this unit. Heredity, variation, and genetics. So genes are the units of heredity and are made up of segments of DNA. Genes are passed on to the next generation via reproductive cells called gametes, what in humans we call egg and sperm. And most DNA in the living system is packaged as chromosomes. Humans have 46 in their somatic cells or body cells. Um, which are all cells of the body except the gametes and the precursors. And a gene-specific um, position along a chromosome is called its locus, its location. Probably know this already, but a quick review. Asexual repro reproduction is a single individual passes all its genes to its offspring without the fusion of the gametes. Okay, just basically you're a clone. You're an identical copy of your parent. In sexual reproduction, two parents give rise to offspring with unique characteristics that are a combination of genes inherited from both parents. Um, AP Bio doesn't need you to know lots of different life cycles, but just understand that a life cycle is the gender generation sequence of stages in the reproductive history of an organism. So, sets of chromosomes in human cells. Human somatic cells, like body cells, skin, hair, eyes, liver, stomach, whatever, have 23 pairs of chromosomes. A karyotype is basically a picture of those chromosomes from a cell. Um, and two chromosomes in each pair are called homologous chromosomes or homologs. That means you've got 23 pairs of chromosomes. One of those pairs came from your dad, one came from your mom. Together we call them homologs. Okay. And they have the same genes on them. This one has the genes for hair color, eye color, um, stomach size, and so does this one. Uh, that's why we call them homologs because they have the same genes on them in the same order. Will they have the same versions of the gene? Probably not, or maybe not, but they will have the same genes. Here we can see um, homologs um, of duplicated chromosomes. So we have two sister chromatids making up this chromosome and two over here making up this chromosome. So it looks like essentially there are four copies of the DNA here. Here's a copy of this one. Here's a copy of this one. And then these are homologs as well. So we have four versions of the gene at this point when it's replicated before it goes into mitosis or meiosis to separate them out again. So this is after S phase in the uh, cell cycle where they're synthesizing or replicating new DNA. The sex chromosomes, uh, females have XX, males have XY. Um, those are called the sex chromosomes. Uh, the other 22 pairs are called autosomes. They're the same in every individual regardless of sex. Um, each pair of homologous chromosomes includes one chromosome from each parent. Uh, the 46 chromosomes in a human cell are two sets of 23, one from mom and one from dad. Um, and we call that a diploid cell, or 2N, two times the number of chromosome sets, um, 46 chromosomes. In a cell uh, in which DNA synthesis has occurred, uh, each chromosome is replicated. So we've gone through G1, S phase, and S phase we re reproduce it. So we had originally in the cell during G1, we had one long blue, one medium blue, and one short blue, one long red, one medium red, medium red, and one short red. Okay. Um, so that's the normal complement, six chromosomes in there, one of each, of each pair. So we get a long pair, a medium pair, and a short pair, one from mom, one from dad. In S phase, we replicate it and make our sister chromatids, which stick together but we still consider them a chromosome, okay? And these would be a homologous pair. A gamete, a sperm or egg, contains just a single set of chromosomes and is haploid, or N. For humans, the haploid N number is 23. Each set of 23 consists of 22 autosomes and one sex chromosome. In egg, unfertilized egg, ovum, the sex chromosome is always an X. So females only pass on X chromosomes. Males have a 50-50 chance of passing on an X or a Y. 
So we've got these two gametes, egg and sperm, each with 23 chromosomes in them. When we fertilize that egg with this sperm and they come together, we get back up to our diploid number of 46 chromosomes. And we call that fertilized egg a zygote. And that zygote will then undergo mitosis to develop into the rest of the cells that make us up. So at sexual maturity, the ovaries and testes produce haploids, gametes. So that over here, we got ovaries and testes. They go through meiosis to make haploid gametes, egg and sperm, with only half the amount of DNA in it. Fertilization, we combine them, so we're back up to our normal amount of DNA. And then we grow up and we start the life cycle over again. This is why... If you're a sexually reproducting organism, you have to go through meiosis. You have to have the number of chromosomes. If mom and dad each passed on 46 chromosomes, and the kids that have 92, and their kids that have more and more and more and more. So every time you have a kid, you gotta, can only pass on half of those chromosomes. One copy of every gene, one copy of every chromosome. It may be the one you got from your mom. It may be the one we got from your dad, but you're only going to pass on one of them to your kids. And that's part of what gives us our genetic diversity. We're going to get more detailed into that as we get into this unit. So let's talk about how we do have those number of chromosomes. It's very similar to mitosis, which we learned about in the last unit. Um, we still have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis, but there are a few key differences that allow us to have the number of chromosomes. So meiosis takes us from a diploid to a haploid cell, from 46 to 23 in humans, other numbers of chromosomes in other organisms. Um, like mitosis, meiosis is preceded by the replication of chromosomes in S phase. Meiosis, though, takes place over two consecutive uh, divisions, meiosis one and meiosis two. And those two cell divisions result in four daughter cells in meiosis, rather than just the two identical daughter cells that we have in mitosis. In addition, these four daughter cells from meiosis have half as many chromosomes. They're, diplo they're haploid, N equals 23. Over here, we got 46 chromosomes. So we got to get to this. Uh, stages of meiosis. Uh, first, they. Um, this is kind of a general overview. You're going to need to more know, need to know more detail. Chromosomes duplicate during interphase. So we go from one copy of the dad's chromosome, one copy of the chromosome we got from our mom, and now we have those sister chromatids. They're still called a chromosome, though, even though they're sister chromatids stuck together. We're still calling them a chromosome, and here are our homologous chromosomes. Meiosis one, we split the homologous chromosomes. Meiosis two, we split the sister chromatids apart. And that's how we get to just one copy in an egg, whereas in the original cell we had two copies of that chromosome. Here is a big overview of the process and what's going on in there. Um, you can take a look at this, but we're going to go through each process in a little bit of detail and then put this slide back up afterwards. So division of meiosis one occurs in four phases, prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, and telophase one in cytokinesis. Very similar um, structurally to what happened in mitosis uh, with a few key differences. Okay. In prophase one, each chromosome pairs with its homologue and something called crossing over occurs. So this pair of sister chromatids, this chromosome pairs up with its homologue over here. The one, here's the one from dad, here's the one from mom, right? And there's something called crossing over, which we'll get into later, but it's really important. It can only happen during prophase one. Um, the X-shaped regions called chiasmata are the sites of crossover. So where these two homologous chromosomes line up right here and here, that's where we can have crossing over. So after interphase, the sister chromatids are held together by proteins called cohesions. Um, those are very strong. In mitosis, these would fall apart so you could split the chromatids. Not in meiosis. Meiosis, these are going to be very strong. The non-sister chromatids are broken at precisely corresponding positions. And we can actually, uh, the zipper-like structure called the synaptomial complex holds the homologs together tightly. Um, any of those DNA breaks are repaired. Uh, and when that happens, it can join... Um, DNA from one non-sister chromatid to the corresponding segment of another, and that's the crossing over. We'll show that more clearly in a minute. So here are our two sister blue chromatids, our two sister green chromatids, one home chromosome, another chromosome, and then these are our two homologs, homologous chromosomes together. 
here we got the crossover point here. You can see where the red connects to the blue and the blue connects to the red. Okay, and we have this crossing over here. So it's now this chromosome is blue, red, blue, and the one below it is red, blue, red. So we've swapped chunks of chromosomes from one to the other. So these chromosomes are no longer no longer look like the parent chromosomes. They are unique combinations of the genes at this point. Metaphase one, very simple. They line up at the metaphasal plate. Uh, in this case, the homologs stay paired up and line up at the uh, metaphase plate, whereas in mitosis, um, they wouldn't. It would just be the sister chromatids lining up here. The homologs line up together. We can see we got basically four copies here. There's one chromosome with two sister chromatids, another chromosome with two sister chromatids. They line up at the middle. Well, we attach uh, spindle fibers from each side, so we can start pulling them apart in anaphase one. Anaphase one, we separate homologous chromosomes, not chromatids, homologous chromosomes. You can see the chromatids are still stuck together here. We've separated the homologous chromosomes, and some of these have crossover events, which mean that they are unique from where they were before. Telophase one and cytokinesis, we're forming the nucleus and separating the cytoplasm Again, just like we did in mitosis. In animal cells, um, cleavage for real forms, they just kind of pinch off. In plant cells, remember, it's cell plate forms. Same things we saw in mitosis. Here's another difference. Whereas after mitosis, you'd go into G1, S, G2, and do it again. In meiosis, you go straight from meiosis 1 into meiosis 2. There's no growth. There's no replication. You just keep splitting things. So here is meiosis 1 again. Uh, prophase 1. Homologous chromosomes uh, come together and hook up. Crossing over can occur at this point. Metaphase one, homologous chromosomes line up at the center plate as opposed to just sister chromatids in mitosis. Anaphase one, we pull apart the homologous chromosomes, not the chromatids, the chromosomes, and we wind up with two cells um, with one pair of one of the homologous chromosomes in each, made up of two sister chromatids. We'll watch this video, which I think does a nice job of summarizing it for you. You should likely, when you're done with this, uh, make your own model or drawing of what's going on and make sure you can explain all the parts. That'd be a good way to synthesize this. It's hard to memorize it. It's a lot easier if you actually work your way through it. Humans produce gametes, eggs and sperm, through the process of meiosis. Here, We'll follow the production of male gametes by focusing on this cell as it goes through meiosis. Let's begin in the nucleus, where genetic information is stored in chromosomes. Most of a person's cells are diploid, with two sets of chromosomes. One set is from their mother, shown here in red, and the other set is from their father, shown in blue. Each maternal chromosome has a corresponding paternal chromosome. These matched pairs are called homologous chromosomes. During interphase, chromosomes are duplicated. Each chromosome now consists of two identical copies called sister chromatids. Zooming in, we see that each sister chromatid is made up of DNA wound around histone proteins. Each strand coils up into a tight helical fiber. As meiosis begins, a spindle forms and duplicated centrosomes start to migrate toward opposite poles of the cell. Back in the nucleus, the chromosomes are condensing. In meiosis, homologous chromosomes stick together in pairs. The close association of homologous chromosomes allows segments of non-sister chromatids to trade places. This recombination of maternal and paternal genetic material is a key feature of meiosis. After the spindle forms and the nuclear envelope breaks down, microtubules from opposite poles attach to each chromosome of the homologous pair, resulting in a tug of war. At metaphase one, the chromosome pairs are positioned in the middle of the cell. The next stage begins when homologous chromosomes separate from each other and move toward opposite poles. 
each chromosome still consists of two sister chromatids. This cell began meiosis with 46 chromosomes, but each daughter cell now has only 23 chromosomes. In meiosis II, microtubules from opposite poles attach to the chromosomes, which then move to the center of the cell. Next, the sister chromatids separate, becoming full-fledged chromosomes that move to opposite poles. Nuclear envelopes reform, and each daughter cell divides into two cells. We started with a single diploid cell, and now that meiosis is complete, we have four haploid cells cells with a single set of chromosomes. These haploid cells mature into gametes that can contribute to the next generation. All right, so now let's go on to meiosis two, which is the video preview just a little bit. It has the same parts in it, but we call it two. So prophase two, metaphase two, anaphase two, telophase two, and cytokinesis. It's very similar to mitosis. We are splitting chromatids again, like we did in mitosis. Prophase one, spindle apparatus forms. Late, or prophase two, sorry. Late in prophase two, the chromosomes, each still composed of two chromatids, move towards this metaphasal plate. At metaphase two, spindle fibers attach to each of the two sister chromatids. Okay, we're going to split these sister chromatids apart at this point. We didn't do that before. Now we are. And this, so this at this point looks a lot more like late mitosis does because we're splitting sister chromatids. Anaphase two, chromatids are split. And you can see we got these crossing over, so we got some unique new chromosomes. Same genes on them, but different combinations than there would have been on either the mom or the dad. Telophase two and cytokinesis, we're just separating the, the nuclei and the uh, cytoplasm again. So at the end of meiosis, there are four daughter cells, each with a haploid set of unreplicated chromosomes. And each of those daughter cells is genetically distinct from the others and from the parent cell because of all the different crossing over and independent assortment and segregation that we saw in there that we will specifically talk about uh, as we come up uh, here in the notes a little bit more. So just to recap, prophase two, uh, these chromosomes, we have them in two different cells now, left over from my, my uh, meiosis one. Um, they're going to start to form. They line up in the middle at metaphase plate. The sister chromatids pull apart in anaphase two, and we form two cells out of each of these for a total of four haploid daughter cells when we're all done. And this puts it all together. I recommend you pause this here and draw this out or make sure you thoroughly understand what's happening before you move on. <clears throat> All right, what are some of the differences between meiosis and mitosis? Mitosis conserves the number of chromosomes, uh, producing cells that are genetically identical to the parent cells, same number of chromosomes with the same genes in the same spots. Meiosis reduces the number of chromosome sets from two diploid to one haploid, producing cells that differ genetically from each other and from the parent cells, whole unique cells that look nothing like the other cells that are produced or like the parent cells that they came from. Here's a picture that summarizes that. You can see mitosis, separating them, bang, two in at the end. Looks very much like the parent one did before S phase. So here they're showing both these after S phase, after they replicated the DNA. Okay, we got meiosis one here, meiosis two here. Here is a written out version of the same thing. If somebody likes um, text to help you understand this stuff, you may want to copy this into your notes, but I'll let you do that on your own. It's all stuff we've already talked about. Three events are unique to meiosis and occur, all three occur in meiosis one. The synapsis and crossing over that happens in prophase one where homologous chromosomes physically connect and exchange genetic information. That's very unique and very important for genetic diversity in a population. Homologous pairs um, line up at the metaphase plate as opposed to just the sister chromatid chromosomes. So we got the homologous pairs lining up. 
and then getting pulled apart as opposed to just the sister chromatids lining up one, 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 one along the way. And then in anaphase one, we separate those homologs, which we also don't do in um, mitosis. In mitosis, we're separating these sister chromatids. Sister chromatid cohesion allows mm -hmm. sister chromatids to stay together through meiosis one. Uh, in mitosis, cohesions are cleaved at the end of metaphase. In meiosis, those cohesions are cleaved along the chromosome arms in anaphase one where we separate the homologs, and at the centromeres in anaphase 2, where we separate the sister chromatids. And this is why we call meiosis 1 a reductional division, because we are reducing uh, the number of chromosomes per cell from 46 to 23 in humans. So how does meiosis uh, contribute to genetic diversity? Or how does meiosis and sex lead to diversity? Kind of hinted at that already, but let's go a little deeper. So a little bit of an overview of genetic diversity. Um, genetic variation produced in sexual life cycles contributes to evolution. This is a key background piece for our unit on evolution, guys, is that um, all these things that are happening in meiosis help increase variation, which helps organisms survive. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, is ultimately any changes in organisms' DNA, the original source for that diversity comes from mutations. Some misstep in the replication process during S phase, you wind up with a new version of a gene or a new gene altogether um, that can be passed on to the kids, um, depending on where they happen, if they happen in the cells that give rise to egg and sperm. So mutations create different versions of the gene, which we call alleles. We remember that from biology. And we can reshuffle those alleles during sexual reproduction, which provides, which provides unique combinations of those new alleles, some of which have been around before, some of which have never existed before. You know, somebody who's tall and fast, for instance, maybe that was a new combination, right? So the origins of genetic variation among offspring, the behavior of chromosomes during meiosis and fertilization is responsible for most of the variation that rises in each generation. So though the original variations that pop up come from mutations, most of the variation in a given generation um, comes from different combinations of the alleles and genes that are already out there. Okay, you think about this in your brothers and your sisters, right? The differences there are due to different combinations of the alleles you inherited from your parents. Three mechanisms contribute to genetic variation. One, the independent assortment of chromosomes, which happens during meiosis. Two, crossing over, which happens during meiosis. And three, random fertilization, which happens during fertilization. Uh, which sperm is fertilized by which egg. Okay, so let's take a look at independent assortment first. Hom homologous pairs of chromosomes orient randomly at metaphase one of meiosis. Uh, each pair of chromosomes sorts maternal and paternal homologs into daughter cells independent of the other pairs. So even though this one has got blue on the left and red on the right, and they'll thus get separated into different cells uh, when they go through meiosis one, um, doesn't mean that it has to be blue on the left and red on the white. It could be red on the left and blue on the white, right. Okay. And then you multiply that by the number of chromosome pairs you have in humans, that's 23 and other organisms more or less. You get quite a lot of variability possible there. So here we can see with just a two chromosome organism, we can have up to four different combinations of uh, chromosome assortment. One, two, three, four. Okay. All of them have a long and a short, which is what the parents start out with, one long and one short, um, but we have different combinations of them. You don't need to know this, uh, but it's basically two times the n number, uh, where n is the haploid number, gives you the number of possible combinations. So for humans, where n equals 23, there are like 8.4 million possible combinations of chromosomes. It's nuts. 8.4 million possible combinations of chromosomes from one individual going into the different egg and sex cells, egg and sperm, right? So then you got 8.4 million different possible eggs with 8.4 million different possible sperm. In fertilization, you can see how the possibilities are exponential here. Then we add in crossing over which produces recombinant chromosomes, which combine the DNA inherited from each parent. Crossing over contributes to genetic variation by combining the DNA from two parents into a single chromosome. 
Um, and on average, humans have between one and three crossover events per chromosome. So one to three crossovers per chromosome. We got 23 pairs of them. That's a lot of crossing over, and that's just average. You can't have more. So let's take a look at how that affects it. Here we got a pair of homologs. We're just looking at one chromosome here, one chromosome pair. Okay. Then we get our crossing over events. And we go through into phase two. And we can see here's one that looks like the dads. Here's one that looks like the red ones. And here's brand new recombinant. Completely new combinations there. And this video is not going to run today, but that's all right. Um, I can show this in class. It's just showing what we already showed. Now we have in random fertilization. As said, genetic variation, because any sperm can fuse with any egg. Okay. So you got the fusion of two gametes, each with 8.4 million possible chromosome combinations from independent assortment, produces a zygote with any of about 70 trillion diploid combinations. And that doesn't even account for crossing over and how much that plays a role. Um, in other words, each zygote has a unique ge genetic identity. Uh, the chances that any brother or sister are going to be identical, um, unless they're identical twins, which is a different mechanism altogether than this, um, is practically zero. And how does this connect to evolution? Uh, natural selection results in the accumulation of genetic variations favored by the environment, right? So if you've got a particular combination of genes and alleles, it helps you to either survive and or pass on more of your genes to the next generation. In other words, have more kids. Um, those alleles are going to be more prevalent in the population than the ones that didn't help as much. Sexual reproduction contributes to the genetic variation of population, which originally originates from mutations. And animals that always reproduce asexually are quite rare. Um, even bacteria, which clone themselves a lot of time, can do some um, crossing over of genetic material um, at times as well. And that'll do it for this, guys. We'll see you on the next section notes.